Hello, hello, welcome to the Truth Serum. Today I am so excited. We're gonna talk about Christopher Columbus and wow, it's gonna bless you. I know some of you are like, huh, that's crazy. With everything going on in the world, as upside down as things seem, you're gonna talk about some 500 year old sailor? Yeah, exactly, because get this, if you could understand what's up with Christopher, you will be in a much better place to understand everything else that's going on in the world. It's sort of like in Mark 4, the parable of the sower. The disciples were like, Jesus, we don't get it. Break it down for us. And Jesus was like, man, if you can't understand this parable, how will you understand all the rest of them? He was giving them the key to unlocking all the rest of the parables. And that's what today's discussion is going to be. You understand this, you understand so much more. Did you know that at the time of filming this, last week, a man was sentenced to several years in prison for toppling down a Christopher Columbus statue? But it's not just him. Riders hacked off his head in Boston. They threw him in a lake in Richmond, Virginia. They drenched him in red paint in Miami and dragged him down the pedestals in St. Paul, Minnesota. For those of you who watched my last broadcast, you know where I stand with the wokeness. But I have to admit, with Christopher Columbus, you know, I don't blame them for wanting to take him down and throw a statue in the river. Because here's the crazy thing. If you just landed on our planet and knew nothing of our history and wanted to learn about Christopher Columbus and just Googled him, looked him up in Wikipedia, checked out a few memes, read the most recent popular books, you would end up with the firm conviction that Christopher Columbus was a murderer and a tyrant, a scoundrel who committed horrible abuses upon innocent Native Americans. You'd want to tear down every statue of Christopher Columbus too. You would feel morally justified and think everyone who still supported the guy was a bigoted, racist, white supremacist too. Check out this meme. And here's a website topping Google search results happens to be CNN. Why Christopher Columbus wasn't the hero we learned about in school. That's the title. And it goes on to say, people have been tearing down statues of Columbus to bring awareness to, get this, the cruelty he brought upon indigenous people. So this quote news article makes it a statement of fact that he exercised cruelty upon the natives. Hmm, look at this one. Pops up pretty quick on a Google search from Vox. It says, quote, the title, Nine Reasons Christopher Columbus Was a Murderer, Tyrant, and Scoundrel. Why do we even celebrate Columbus Day? And here's the gist from Wikipedia. It says, quote, As a colonial governor, Columbus was accused by his contemporaries of significant brutality, which led to his arrest and removal. The article suggests that he, too, savagely abused the natives, men, women, and children, sold them into slavery, and forced them to work in the gold mines and got arrested for it. Really, really. But here's the big kahuna. The most popular history book on the subject of Columbus in all of America history today is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. Zinn's book is pushed by Hollywood celebrities. It's fawned over by university professors and peddled to young students by middle and high school teachers. But it doesn't stop there. There's references to it in movies. TV shows, History Channel has documentaries, there's role-playing activities for kids, there's workshops for teachers and librarians, dozens of spin-off volumes, there's graphic adaptations for the kids, there's even dramatic public readings of Howard Zinn's book at parks. You know, just kind of fun for the whole family. His history teacher, Mr. Cushman, is teaching your son that if Columbus was alive today, he would go on trial for crimes against humanity like Milosevic. It's not just my teacher, it's the truth. It's in my history book. You want to read a real history book, read Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. And in Zinn's book, Christopher Columbus is portrayed as, yeah, you guessed it, a murderer, tyrant, scoundrel, and the natives pure as the driven snow. Okay, so what's the truth about Christopher Columbus? Well, let's go. Let's talk about genocide, tyranny, and human exploitation. This is going to be fun. The first thing you have to note is that there's actually a lot of original source material. We don't have to do a lot of guessing. Columbus went on four voyages to the Americas. Those involved thousands of individuals. There were doctors, there were court officials from Spain, and they kept records, diaries, memoirs. They wrote letters. Christopher Columbus's own son published all of his writings. Folks, we have lots of records. So let's crack this thing open. 
perspective. Folks, this is 500 years ago. There's a reason the time period is called medieval. So in terms of how people were living their lives, it's best to get this picture out of your head. In such a situation, you have no time to think. Instinct takes over. It's either kill or be killed. And consider something more like this. <laughs> Meaning we can't put our lens on it. They weren't starting each day with a half-calf grande caramel macchiato with sprinkles before zipping off to work in a Prius. And that is exactly what most articles and videos about Christopher Columbus, they don't do. They don't put it in perspective. Wikipedia and all those others fail to mention this one massive point. Everyone had slaves back then. Without that little factoid, the whole thing is skewed. To say that someone back then had a slave is pretty much like accusing someone today of having a cell phone. Everyone has a cell phone. 500 years ago, pretty much everyone had slaves. Even the Native Americans had slaves. Second thing we have to keep in mind, this is the age of conquest. Everyone was doing it. People were going to war and conquering other people, not just white people. Okay, no more intro, here we go. Christopher Columbus lands in what is now the Caribbean islands and he meets the Tainos. And you know what he says about them? He says, quote, I believe that in the world there are no better people or a better land. They love their neighbors as themselves. They have the sweetest speech in the world. They are gentle and always laughing. Wow. Columbus is like, these people are incredible. They're the best in the world. And he has a wonderful relationship with them. No violence on either side. So he tells the king and queen of Spain. He says, these are the most kindest folks in the world. They are equal and they should have all the same rights as all other citizens. So Columbus develops a friendship with the Taino chief Guacanagari. And the chief is like, Chris, um, look, don't let the smooth taste fool you. We are not all like this. There are others and they hunt us down and eat us. Yeah, straight up. They eat us like Eggo waffles eat us. And Columbus is like, um, I don't know if you just smoked a little too much peyote this morning, but bruh, we're in the 15th century. I don't believe you. People don't eat people. And so Columbus, he needs to go back to Spain for supplies. And as they go, one of the ships, the Santa Maria, gets shipwrecked. And they decide it's best that the crew will stay behind. And Columbus gives the ones left behind clear instructions to treat the natives with kindness and gratitude. We have that on record. Oh, and here's a little fun fact. As Columbus makes preparations to go back to Spain, a bunch of Tainos, they want to go back with them. They hear of this new place, this other world. They hear of a king and a queen, and they want to meet them. So Columbus takes back something like six Tainos, but he said more of the Tainos, they want to go back with them, but there is no room. Yeah, you heard that right. They actually wanted to go back. It was, it was pretty much a field trip for them. So they go back, all six are baptized, and baptized people cannot be enslaved. Two of them decided to remain in the king's court and were treated and given complete celebrity status. They are honored and esteemed in the Spanish court. Second voyage, it's a big one. There's 17 ships involved, 1,200 men, and it's designated for settlement. So now we really have two worlds colliding, and this is where the plot thickens. When Columbus gets back, he finds all 39 of the men he left there from his first voyage dead, slaughtered. And there's a dispute as to what actually happened and why. It seems the crew wants to attack the chief in retaliation, but Columbus believes the chief, that it was a rival tribe who did it, and possibly because the crew of the Santa Maria did not listen to Columbus's command and did commit abuses against the natives, during Columbus's absence. So we have a journal now dated December 26, and the chief again reveals to Columbus the atrocities being committed by the Caribs, which included rape, castration, torture, slaughter, and cannibalism. Some of the Tainos would become completely frozen in fear just by mention of the Caribs, this rival native group. Listen to this quote, from a journal diary of the time. The chief then prepared to go ashore, inviting the admiral, Christopher Columbus, to the feast. The chief again complains to Columbus about the Caribs who captured his people and takes them away to be eaten. 
but it says the chief was greatly overjoyed when the admiral comforted him by showing him weapons and promising to defend him. So basically, Columbus says, I got your back and promises to help the chief. And he does. And Columbus begins to search for the Caribs. And guess what? He finds them. Well, he doesn't really find them. Instead, when he arrives at a Carib village, he finds huts of Taino women. And so they ask them, where are the Caribs? And they're like, oh, they're always gone. They go from one island to another. They depopulate the island. They stay until they eat all of them. And then they go to another island. So the Taino women tell them we are their sex slaves. They rape and they eat the children we produce for them. The women tell the medical doctors that were there, the Caribs or the Canibs, from where we get the word cannibal, when the Caribs take any boys as prisoners, they remove their organs, fatten the boys until they grow to manhood, and then when they wish to make a great feast, they kill and eat them. For they say the flesh of boys and women is not good to eat. Here's one person's account of the scene when they entered a village. Quote, for of the human bones we found in their houses, everything that could be gnawed had already been gnawed, so that nothing else remained of them but what was too hard to be eaten. In one of the houses we found the neck of a man undergoing the process of cooking in a pot. So they find all of this and are completely overwhelmed at the sight. So Columbus liberates the Taino women and then goes on a mission to attack and stop the Caribs from any more of this. And in doing so, he begins to free more and more women being trafficked and abused like this. This is from Alessandro Heraldini, Bishop of Santo Domingo. He writes, The Caribs eventually take the bodies of those they had captured in war, and if they were plump, they roasted them hanging from large trees on poles or boiled them in large pots made of clay. And if they were too thin, they stuff them with various rich foods. Then one of the Caribs walks around the pitiful flock of children and then with a single slash, he cuts the head off of this one or that, as many as he pleases. Then as a great cheer from the abominable men follows, they celebrate a feast day, a day filled with pleasure on the flesh of children, fattened beyond what is human. In a second village, even more gruesome scenes were witnessed. Over 20 women were liberated by Columbus and his men. It's recorded that these slaves begin to flee to the Europeans in seeking refuge from their captors. Historical documents show that they were, quote, delighted when Columbus would arrive. Um, yeah, folks, again, this is the age of conquest. And guess what? Columbus goes to war against these guys. From manuscripts in the late 1400s and early 1500s says this, the Admiral Christopher Columbus, he goes from island to island, freeing Tainos, enslaved women and mutilated men and children who had been captured by the Caribs and destroying their boats to limit future raids and to deter future acts of terror, Columbus orders the taking of Carib men, women and children prisoner for later sale as slaves in Spain. So who is Christopher Columbus? He was a sailor, but he was also a warrior who risked his life and liberated women and children from a tradition of the most gruesome sexual abuse of women and physical abuse of children pretty much known to man. And on a scale and degree few today could even fathom. And yet we're tearing him down. Aha, but Carmen, you see, he made the Carib slaves. Um, what would you do? They would literally eat you. And not just because you're a foreigner, not because you did anything, no abuse, no retaliation. That's just what they did to their own kind. It was their custom, their religion. You only have two options, kill or be killed and eaten. And the third option, if you're on the winning side and you don't want to kill them, or be eaten by them, you can enslave them. So, did Christopher Columbus rape natives? No, there is not one single historical text by the natives or by the Spaniards at the time that states Christopher Columbus raped anyone. But wait, do we have records of Columbus's treatment of those Caribs whom he now sold as slaves? Yes, we actually do. And this is what Columbus himself writes January 30th, 1494 in a letter 
that among other things proposes that the queen accepts the Caribs as prisoners of war for sale as slaves. And so he writes, We send by these two vessels some of these cannibal men and women, as well as some children, both male and female, whom their highness might order to be placed under the care of the most competent persons to teach them the language. He goes on, quote, At the same time, they might be employed in useful occupations and by degrees through somewhat more care being bestowed upon them than upon other slaves, they would learn one from the other. It must be evident that nothing but good can come from sending to Spain men and women who may thus one day be led to abandon their barbarous custom of eating their fellow creatures. By learning the Spanish language in Spain, they will much earlier receive baptism and advance the welfare of their souls. End quote. This was his intent for the treatment of slaves to improve their lives. And yet, what have you heard of this? <whistles> Folks, we are being peddled information that is so one-sided, so off balance, so untrue that we are on the verge of sliding off this earth completely. There are other myths and lies we don't have time to get into here, but I do want to touch on one. Was Columbus arrested and sent back to Spain in handcuffs and put in prison? Yes. But do you want to know why? It was not because of his torture and abuse of the natives. It was because Columbus tried and executed by hanging seven Spanish rebels for mistreating and taking advantage of the natives. And when he got back to Spain, he was completely exonerated. Now check this out. Last year, published in Scientific Reports, states, For years, researchers tried to prove that Christopher Columbus encounters with cannibal marauders during his trip to the Caribbean in 1492 that they were just myths. The scientific journal goes on and states, a new study suggests that Columbus's stories may have been the truth. William Keegan, Florida Museum of Natural History, curator of Caribbean archeology span states, I've spent years trying to prove Columbus wrong when he was right. Friends, the fact of cannibalism in that time and region is clearly no myth. Down the street in Mexico, it was widely and routinely practiced by Mayans and Aztecs. It's in their archeology, span it's in their artwork, it's in their historical documents. Folks, the truth is being purposely hidden and the lies are being pushed, published, and taught. We know this and yet, I just watched another video backed by PBS, again purporting that Columbus just made this whole cannibal thing up as a myth to justify his apparent cruel actions against the natives. Yet, you could go to Mexico and there's actually a city called the place where they ate them. Look, we've been so corrupted and poisoned by multiculturalism and political correctness, it's entered every arena of our society. It's become normal and accepted to say negative things about white people and taboo to say anything negative about anybody of color. That is so unbiblical and it's so dangerous. The Bible says, let no unwholesome communication proceed out of your mouth. Judge no one. The point is not to throw shade at the native populations, not at all, but simply to gain proper perspective. We have to be willing to admit that this was a very real reality in pre-Columbian culture. It should not be hidden, nor should the atrocities of the Europeans be hidden. Just like the beauty of the native culture should not be hidden or exaggerated, it's the same as the European. And the big takeaway is that like it or not, Columbus's stumbling into the Americas had the result of ending massive ritual human sacrifice and cannibalism. And that's kind of a big deal, and it's kind of a good thing. Honest historians are recognizing that there were many, many native tribes that were thankful to Columbus for freeing them and saving them from certain doom from these other hostile tribes. So, Maybe instead of telling this to Christopher Columbus, maybe the correct reaction is something more like this. Good job. Thanks, Hancock.
So let's double back to our friend Howard Zinn. Guess what we've learned about Zinn and his infamous book, A People's History? It's a total fraud. Historians left, right, center, up and down, all saying it's not true. It's exactly like the 1619 Project. It's patently false. All objective historians are unanimous with this. And what we find is Zinn didn't actually discover any new documents at all. Instead, do you know what he did? He literally cut, dragged, and clipped and pasted material so that the original meaning is twisted to mean the exact opposite. He moves punctuation and sentences around so that motives and intentions are mischaracterized. He omits key passages so that it makes it sound the opposite of what was truly meant. It's not just my teacher, it's the truth. It's in my history book. If you want to read a real history book, read Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Look, it's a little known fact, a common tactic in creating a socialist color revolution, a trick to tear down a country is to deem everything good and right by people of color and deem everything wrong and evil by whites or Christians or capitalists. Christopher Columbus was in fact a devout Christian which motivated him at every turn. The entire point of Zen and modern day media and academia is to use lies, trickery, propaganda to incite hatred of America. The country that for the first time in modern history gives power to the people, is governed by the people, ruled from the bottom up, if you will. And ironically, Zen, though claiming to be for the people, advocates for a system of government that is completely top down. It offers no rights to those at the bottom, a system that has oppressed, exploited, and murdered more people than any other system in the modern world. Folks, this is beyond politics. This is spiritual. We are not to be ignorant of our enemy's strategies. This needs to be taught in Bible studies and Bible colleges and universities just as much as hermeneutics. The motive behind all of this cancel culture is not just hatred of America, but hatred of Christ and Christianity and all things that flow from Christ Jesus, freedom, truth, life, and prosperity. And keeping it real, following Columbus, his successors, yes, there were absolutely atrocities and mistreatment of natives. Please don't get me wrong. Not to mention the atrocities of the Trail of Tears, Wounded Knee, the massacre at Sand Creek. Look, there were horrible, egregious wrongdoings. The moral of the story is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And evil men do horrible things apart from transformation by the Lord Jesus Christ. The new world was not paradise. Neither was Europe. There was brutality and war on both hemispheres. All right, I got to wrap this up. So friends, here's the takeaway. There is a false picture being painted all around you. Just look at all the issues we're dealing with right now. News, media, entertainment, politics, science, economics, the world system is married to the father of lies, the destroyer. You have to stop listening to it. The intent is distort your view of reality and destroy freedom, prosperity, and happiness. Friendship with the world is the hatred of God, the Bible says. And the more you love the things of the world, the more you will listen to and believe the lies of the world. And the total end game, beyond trying to incite your hatred of America, beyond that is for you to have a false view of God, to keep you from your heavenly father, your creator. God is love. And ultimately that love is revealed in his son, Jesus Christ, whom God would send down to earth where Jesus Christ would give up his rightful place in authority in the heavens. He would wrap himself in human flesh and take your sins in mine and die on a cross for you and me. We just celebrated Christmas. What's the song say? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. God has goodwill towards you. That means he loves you. He desires good things for your life. That means his kindness is available to you through his son, Jesus Christ. His goodness, his friendship, his help, his strength, his wisdom. It's available to you today. I pray that you would see through the veil of darkness 
and reach out to him. He's waiting. I'll see you next time.